Yesterday, as you know, was Shiva Sarvatamus. So we've entered the season of mourning for the temple. And I think there's a point which is very, very important for us to reiterate. There is a tendency in Jewish life, perhaps in life generally, to try to rationalize the status quo. If things are a certain way, so we try to justify their being that way. And we don't want to find ourselves living in a situation where things are not as they should be. So we figure out various rationalizations and justifications for the status quo being as it is. Now the lack of a temple for hundreds and hundreds of years traditionally has viewed been viewed as the failure to rectify the sins for which the temple was destroyed. As Chazal tell us, the temple was destroyed for various sins. And uh, the fact that we don't have the temple shows that we've never repented, we've never rectified those sins, and that's why we don't have the temple now. Chazal say that any generation in which the Beis HaMikdash has not been rebuilt should look at it as if it was destroyed in that generation. It's exactly that, because if we would have rectified those sins, we'd have the base of English. So if we don't have the base of English, that means that we haven't rectified those sins. We're as guilty as that initial generation. Well, it's very uh, difficult to live like that. Who wants to uh, get up in the morning, look himself in the mirror, and say that we are so sinful that we have caused the destruction of the temple? So uh, rather than doing that, we like to rationalize and say that really we have evolved into a higher, superior state. We've transcended animal sacrifice. We've entered into an era where we serve God fundamentally, primarily through prayer. And therefore, the lack of a temple should not be viewed as something negative, but to the contrary, something positive. We don't want to go back to the barbaric system of old. Now, I'm not saying that anybody in present company looks at it that way. I'm saying there are Jews who look at it that way. And there are Jews to whom the idea of restoring the base of Megdash is something which is so horrific that it's unimaginable. I once had a discussion on this subject with a group of people. I used to give a class many, many years ago in a certain uh, office. And there was a uh, fellow there, a very, very fine gentleman, who was a member in a uh, certain conservative synagogue. And uh, I mentioned the idea that when Mashiach comes, the temple will be rebuilt, animal sacrifice will be restored. And I mentioned a very interesting thing, that how much of the Torah, of the 613 mitzvahs, how many relate directly to the service of the temple? So people would say, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, they pointed out that about a quarter of the 613 mitzvahs relate to the basic Mikdash. The laws of sacrifices, the law of ritual purity, which really is mostly relevant only to the temple. So if a person rejects the idea of the restoration of the animal sacrifice and the temple and the laws of ritual purity in the Messianic age, if you reject that idea, essentially you're throwing out a quarter of the, the Torah. And I mentioned at that time that uh, the conservative movement has taken a very, very strong stance on this. Um, in the 1948 edition of the uh, conservative prayer book, the Silverman edition, I mentioned that because uh, the editor, Rabbi Silverman, is actually from the same city as I am. He was a, a rabbi in Hartford, Connecticut, where I was born, so we are a landslide, so to speak. You see, he writes in the introduction to that edition that uh, they amended the prayers to eliminate any implication that, that we are praying for the restoration of the temple. So, for example, in Musaf, in the weekly Korbanas, where we mention 
that uh, we pray to God to restore the temple, Bisham Naasel and then we will perform the additional sacrifices for Shabbos or for the particular Yomtev. So in that 48th edition, the prayer was amended to change the future tense to past tense. It's a reference to the Shashem Asu Lefanecha. There in the temple they brought these animal sacrifices, not that we will bring them. And he writes in the introduction that the reason he made this seemingly minor correction is because we don't anticipate going back to animal sacrifice. This is what he writes. I mentioned in this class that the, reform, the conservative movement rather has taken a position on this, but of course we believe that that is a rejection of a big chunk of the Torah, and of course when we pray, we pray for the restoration of the temple. So this fellow that was sitting there said, I can't believe that the conservative movement takes that position, and I'm sure that even in conservative Judaism they pray for the restoration of the temple and the restoration of animal sacrifice. So I said, well, ask your rabbi and see what he says. So uh, he came back the next week with a report that he mentioned this to his rabbi, and the rabbi said that if the only grievance Rabbi Breitowitz has with the conservative movement is <laughs> its rejection of animal sacrifice, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> but he should feel bad, because, again, rejecting animal sacrifice is not a rejection of one or two mitzvahs. It's a rejection of a full 24% of the Torah. But it's very tempting to want to say that the status quo is exactly as it's meant to be. This is how it should be. We've outgrown it, so to speak. Because now we serve God uh, much more refined ways. We don't operate in a temple which is a glorified slaughterhouse. You now, it may be difficult for us to appreciate the base of English because we're so far removed from it, but we understand, at least on the intellectual level, that we are praying for its restoration. Things are not as they are meant to be. The status quo is not the way it should be, and the fact we don't have a temple, as we said, is a consequence of Jewish sin, which remains unrectified to this very day, and therefore we have to lament that fact. But this tendency in Jewish life to try to rationalize and justify the way things are in order that we should not feel guilty or deficient, but rather that we should feel that we are exactly as we should be, I think really is the, the point of the, the very perplexing story which begins our parsha and which is really a carryover from the end of last week's parsha. It's a very, very, very mystifying story. There are so many details which don't fall into place. Let's remember what happened. Balak, the king of Moab, feels threatened by the Jewish people, so he hires the wizard Bilaam to curse the Jewish people. It was thought that Bilaam had tremendous power of uh, giving curses, and he could stop the Jews in their tracks. And uh, Bilaam tries three times to curse the Jewish people, and God puts words in his mouth, the curses turn into blessings, and Bilaam fails. But at the end, Bilaam says to Balak, let me tell you, let me give you advice, and tell you the future of the Jewish people, what's going to happen. And there is a prophecy there, a very beautiful prophecy, we've talked about it in past years, which is a prophecy of the Achris Hayam, the end of days, the Messianic age. And in fact, it's a very interesting thing, Bilaam is the first prophet to foretell the Messianic age. If I would ask you, for your question, who was the first prophet to foretell the coming of Mashiach? The answer is Bilaam. But there's something else that Bilaam told Balak, because he said, I'll give you advice. I'll give you advice. So what is the advice? The advice was like this. Okay, I failed. I wasn't able to curse them. But if you really want to bring them down, you should know there's one thing that will put them in a state of disfavor with God. This is how Chazal put it. Their God hates promiscuity. That's the one thing that their God hates. 
And if you can get them to fall into that trap, you'll have them exactly where you want them, and you'll be able to defeat them. So, Balak says, fine. That's exactly what I'll do. So, uh, the daughters of Moab are recruited to seduce the uh, Jewish men. And the Gemara says a, a fantastic thing. How are these women going to seduce the Jewish men? They're going to offer for sale a product that the Jews needed desperately. The Jews needed clay pishtun. The Jews needed linen garments. In the Midbar, in the desert, you really can't uh, grow linen, you can't grow cotton. So you can't grow the materials you need to produce undergarments. So there was always a shortage of these. So offer those for sale, and you can bring the men into the uh, markets, and in the process seduce them. So that's exactly what Balak did. He created a market for clay pitched on for these linen garments, and all the men came, and the, the sales ladies offered them drinks and wine, and seduced them, and uh, they ended up in the process not only engaging in promiscuous acts, they also became involved in Ave Desar. As the women at the last moment said, wait, because if you want to have us, you have to worship our gods too. And the particular deity they worshipped was called Baalpur. Or Baalpur was a very, very vile form of idolatry, and the Jews succumbed to the temptation. And uh, it says, by some of Yisrael Baalpur, they became attached to Baalpur. Attached. And the Gemara says that Samid is a word we find elsewhere in the Torah. The Torah talks about a tightly fitted lid on a vessel. It's called a Samid Pasil. You know, you have one of these uh, jars that's used for canning. You know, it has to have a tight seal in order to keep the uh, bacteria out. So that's a, a summit puzzle, a very tight seal. So it says, they eat some of these pork. They became very tight. They became so attached to this of like Zara that it was like a tight seal. And the Gemara points out that the Jews never were as close to God. When it speaks about God, the most it says is, Vachem had vacim, Vachem alokechem. The you who cleave to God. But the Vakus is not as tight as summit. So the Jews were tighter with Baal Poor than they ever were with the Rebona Shlagmas, the Gemara says. And it says that as a consequence of this, there was a tremendous anger. There was an anger. There was a tremendous anger. And again, anybody reading the Parsha superficially assumes that the anger is because of the sin of Avaydazar. And we know that when God gets angry, it isn't just that uh, he stews inside. Now, there are consequences to his anger. So it seems that there was a magaifa, there was a plague that broke out, and people were going to die as a consequence of this plague. So Rabbi Baruch tells Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, what you have to do to avert the plague is to execute the poor worshippers. So Hashem says, that uh, I'll read you the words. This is in the end of last week's parsha. The Yom Hashem Moshe, Kachas Kol Rashi Ha'am, take the heads of the people, the Haika Yisam Hashem Neged Hashemesh, and hang the poor worshippers in broad daylight. And this will avert God's anger from the Jewish people. So Moshe calls the Shofte Yisrael, Moshe calls the judges, and he says, Here go ish anashav. And it's Madan le Balpur. Kill the people that have become stuck to Balpur. The Rashi here says something which is astounding. How many poor worshippers were there? 10, 20, 30, 
40, 100,000, how many? So listen to what the Cheshben, the Kak Be'esh Mashi makes. It says, Moshe spoke to the Shoftei Yisrael, to the judges of the Jewish people. How many judges were there in the Jewish people? So listen to this calculation that Rashi makes. We know that there were levels of judges. There were Sarai Alafim, there were officers over thousands, there were officers over hundreds, there were officers over fifties, and there were officers over tens. So every ten people had a judge, every fifty people had a judge, every hundred people had a judge, every thousand people had a judge. So if you have a nation of six hundred thousand people, so how many Sarai Alafim are there? How many officers over thousands are there? You have six hundred. How many Sari Mayas are there? 6,000. How many Sari Chamishim? 12,000. How many Sari Asaras? 60,000. So they add the figures up. 60,000, 12,000, 6,000, and 600 is 78,600 judges. So the Jewish people had 78,600 judges. They weren't paid because that would have been, <laughs> would have broken any budget. <laughs> but there were 78,600 judges. And most told each one, each one of you here, go on Ashav, kill two people. So the number of poor worshippers was 78,600 times two. So we're not talking about a small thing, we're talking about very widespread, as yeah. she says. So, all of a sudden, in the middle of this tumult, a fellow comes forward, a Jewish man, and he brings a Midianite woman to Moshe. And everyone is crying, no one knows what to do. And uh, Pinchas follows them into the tent, and he spears the two, and somehow this averts the plague. Now the Gemara tells us the background of this. What happened was, when Moshe Rabbeinu sent the judges to kill the poor worshippers, it seems most of the poor worshippers, the vast majority of the poor worshippers, happened to be, for some strange reason, from the tribe of Shimon. So they went to their Nasi, their prince, who was named Zimri ben Solu. <coughs> And they told him, you got to do something, because Moshe Rabbeinu is sending out the judges to decimate our tribe. So Zimri says, okay, leave it up to me. I'm going to go, and I'm going to undermine Moshe Rabbeinu's authority. If Moshe Rabbeinu's authority is undermined, then the whole judgment will collapse. So he takes this Midianite woman. Now, you may remember Moshe Rabbeinu's wife was from Midian. Zipporah was the daughter of Yisrael, who was the coming, the priest of Midian. So he comes with this woman, and he says, Moshe, Ishazu, this woman, is she permitted or prohibited? So Moshe says, uh, prohibited? She's not Jewish. You can't consort with her. So he says, well, if so, who allowed you to marry the daughter of Yisrael? Now, keep in mind, Moshe Rabbeinu married the daughter of Yisrael before the Torah was given, before the rules applied. Uh, undoubtedly, she underwent the conversion. I mean, there are many, many reasons why there's no analogy, but, uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, everyone is in a state of confusion. So this man is going to show that Moshe Rabbeinu is full of baloney, and uh, what Moshe Rabbeinu says is not going to stop him. So he takes this woman into the tent, and... Uh, no, this is a family class. I don't have to explain what's going to happen. <laughs> now, <laughs> Pinchas gets up, and Pinchas recalls a halacha that by Aramis, if a person has intercourse with a Gentile woman publicly, the rule is kanoi and pagambo, that a zealot is allowed to take the law into his own hands and uh, kill the person. So he goes to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, Moshe Rabbeinu, didn't you teach us this halacha, which of course was forgotten again in the heat of the moment. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, yes, I taught you that. Karaina de igwasa iwileva parvanka. The person who reads the letter should be the herald to carry it out. And Pinchas is given the green light, and he goes with his spear, and he kills Zimri and the Midianite woman 
whose name was Cosby, she was a Midianite princess. And all of a sudden, God's anger is averted. Now, this is a very perplexing story. Because God's anger was seemingly, as we said, related to the sin of idolatry. What this Zimri was doing had nothing to do with idolatry. It was a question of an immoral act designed to undermine the authority of Moshe Rabbeinu. So Pinchas protests what Zimri is doing, and all of a sudden God's anger for the sin of the Buddha Zara disappears, and the Jews are saved. Like what, what, the whole story is, is perplexing. What is, what is going on? So the Sfarno, in a very, very short sentence, the whole discussion is less than 20 words, explains what's going on in the, in the parish. It sounds like this. He says, the original play, God's anger, was not because of the sin of Avaitazar. That's not what God was angry about. I mean, he probably was angry about that. That's not why there was this play. The play is because the Jews were doing nothing about it. You know, there were poor worshippers, and no one was doing anything about it. No one is protesting, no one is stopping. That's why God is upset. So God says, the only way to avert the plague is that the judges should get up, and the judges should execute the poor worshippers, and then if nobody stops the judges, that will rectify their not protesting the poor worshippers. I don't understand this. Let's first hear what he says. That the only way to rectify the not protesting the poor worshippers is to watch the judgment taking place and not protest the judge's action. That will rectify the not having protested the poor worshippers in the first place. Now it's hard to understand this at first glance. How does inaction rectify inaction? How does apathy rectify apathy? In other words, if you do nothing, if you do nothing to stop the judges, that will rectify your having done nothing to protest the worship of poor. How does doing nothing rectify the sin of doing nothing? Doing something can rectify the sin of doing nothing. But how can doing nothing rectify the sin of doing nothing? The answer is like this. Again. You know, if the Jews had done nothing simply because they were apathetic, or temperamentally they were the types of people that don't want to get involved in other people's business, that wouldn't have angered God either. At least not to the extent it would have been a plague. I think what God was angry about was that they turned their apathy into a shita. They turned their apathy into a, an ideological position. They said, listen, says we should protest what other people are doing. People should be tolerant. People should be accepting. Right? This isn't a world in which we should impose our values on others. It might not be my cup of tea, but if, if the person wishes to worship Balpur, so be it. That's his prerogative. I'm, I should stand in his way. <laughs> you know, this is a free country. Now, there are a lot of people that, that, that think that. Aren't there? You know, this is Canada. Canada's a free country. Tolerant. Now, if a person wants to engage in whatever he wants to engage in, I should protest. We shouldn't impose our values on other people. What's wrong about that is that it presupposes that values are optional. Values are things we choose to believe in. They're the mythologies we embrace, those are our values. So therefore, if it's really a vanilla chocolate choice, just because I choose vanilla, I shouldn't protest, you're choosing chocolate. But if we're talking about truth versus falsehood, then I should save you from a delusion. Because if you are living a life which is fundamentally false, 
You're living a life in which one plus one is three. Well, I should take it upon myself to intervene. You can't live like that. How are you going to maintain a budget if one plus one is three? Well, you'll always have enough money. <laughs> right? Because whatever you need, you add it up. You'll have always more than your expenses. So I have to intervene. I can't allow you to live a, a, a false life. But that's what, what the, 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 the poor worshippers did. Not the poor worshippers, the people that witnessed the poor worshippers. They said, we're not going to intervene. But they didn't want to see themselves as being lazy people or apathetic people or frightened people. Right? They didn't want to see their unwillingness to become involved as a flaw. So what they did was they turned it from a flaw into an ideological position. Right? And, and we do that from time to time, right? Because we're too scared to protest, we're too lazy to protest, we're too apathetic to protest. So we turn it into a sheet that, that that's the way it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to protest. I'm supposed to be tolerant and accepting. And uh, if you want to live your life differently than I believe, so be it. That God can't tolerate. God can't tolerate turning a flaw into a virtue. So now, but let's think about this for a second. Let's say you've turned your apathy into an ideology. So now you believe that everyone has the right to do what he wants if I don't protest. But there's one group of people that you still have to protest. It, it's inescapable. Who do you have to protest? The intolerant. And you can't get away from that. In other words, if you're going to declare your ideological position as being a position of tolerance, and that's why you don't protest the evildoers because you say this is their prerogative, they can do what they want, but there's one group that you have to protest. You have to protest the intolerant people, the people that are protesting, <laughs> because uh, otherwise you're, you're inconsistent. Otherwise, your true colors are showing that you really you don't care. So, you know, you don't protest the poor worshipers. You don't protest the people that are killing the poor worshipers. Why? Because you're apathetic. You don't care. You don't want to get involved. But if you really believe a shita, you have an ideology, that we have to be tolerant, then you must protest the intolerant. Mm -hmm. So now you have a situation that Moshe Rabbeinu and the Rebona Shalem have created. We have 78,600 judges are coming to execute the poor worshippers. So all those people that tolerated poor, if they really hold that tolerance is an ideology, they have to stop this. They have to protest the judges. What if they don't? What if they don't? So their not protesting the judges rectifies they're not protesting the poor worshippers. Because <laughs> it shows that they're not protesting the poor worshippers is not because they have an ideology of tolerance. It's because they don't want to get involved, they're scared, they're lazy, you know, they don't want to get into fights. They don't protest anybody. They don't protest the people that worship poor. They don't protest the people that punish people working poor. That's okay. That will avert God's anger. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. If you're lazy, that is a forgivable sin. If you're pathetic, that's a forgivable sin. If you turn your laziness and your apathy into an ideology, that's an unforgivable sin. So this is the test. The test is, if you've turned it into an ideology, you will have to protest the judges who are killing the poor worshippers. If you don't, you've averted God's anger. Okay, so the, the plague is, is going on, and uh, the only way to stop this is by allowing the judges to carry out their function, and no one should protest the judges. But on the other hand, Zimri is facing a crisis, that his entire tribe will be decimated. So he has to nip this in the bud, he has to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from carrying out these judgments. So he wants to totally undermine and humiliate Moshe Rabbeinu. So what does he do? 
he says that he brings this Midianite woman and he says he's going to have intercourse with her publicly and Moshe Rabbeinu was not going to stop him. Pinchas stands up to stop him. And no one protests Pinchas. So you see that the Jews aren't very tolerant. Because if they really were tolerant as an ideological position, they should have stopped Pinchas the intolerant. And they didn't stop him. That averted the divine anger. So the same way that the divine anger would have been averted by the Jews not stopping the judges, the divine anger was averted by the Jews not stopping Pinchas. Even though it was two different issues. The judges were judging regarding Baal Poor. And Pinchas was executing Zimri for the sin of intercourse with a Gentile woman. It's not the same issue. But it is the same issue. It's this issue exactly. That what is the Jewish position? Is the Jewish position tolerance? Or is the Jewish position standing up for truth? And therefore, I might be scared or frightened myself, but if someone is willing to stand up for God's honor, I'm not going to stand in his way. That is what Pinchas is all about. And this might explain a very, very curious thing. Let me ask you a question. Let's see if you think the way I think. What ritual in Jewish life really expresses this idea that a Jew stands up for truth and a Jew doesn't merely see his observances as choices and uh, you know, therefore is tolerant of other people's different choices. There's one ritual in Jewish life that I think symbolizes that we don't tolerate. Yes, the idea that, that, that we stand up for truth, it's not that we, we see our mitzvah observance as a choice that we make and others can make different choices, is bris milah, the circumcision. Now think about it for a second. Now, if I want to do a mitzvah, that's my business. You know, I choose to keep Shabbos, I choose to keep kosher, fine, that's my, you know, it's my business. You have an eight-day-old child, right, you're going to perform surgery on him, you know, a physical disfigurement, and uh, who gives you the right to do that? I mean, aren't you denying him his ultimate choice? Now, this was actually uh, in the news, you know. Every, every good rabbi should read the newspaper <laughs> and not speak about it. But, but in Germany, this was actually the, uh, the, 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 the court made this decision that, uh, that the choice of the child should trump religious indoctrination of the parents. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, I saw a fantastic um, article, I can't remember where I saw it, that someone made the following point, that, um, that at this particular juncture in history, Germany needs the Jews more than the Jews need Germany. Because the birth rate among the German people is so low, that it's well below replacement, and uh, the Jews are uh, known to have very high birth rates, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why the, the Germans really need the Jews more <laughs> than the opposite. But uh, if they ban circumcision in Germany, then the result may be that uh, Jews of choice will leave Germany, and that'll be the end of that. But in any case... They have other nationalities that have high birth rates yeah. in Germany. Yeah, well, the, the, truth is, the particular case had to do with a Muslim, not a Jew, as a matter of fact, but whatever it is. But the point is that that's what the Bismillah is. You see, when we circumcise our children, what we are really saying is this, that we're not talking about a choice. My religious observance is not a choice that I make. It's not a preference. It's not vanilla, chocolate, strawberry. It's endless and checker. It's truth and falsehood. So in the same way that we teach our children math facts 
And we don't say, well, let him grow to be an adult and then he'll figure out for himself what one plus one is. I'm not going to impose my values on him because we're dealing with truth and falsehood. So likewise, when it comes to mitzvahs, when it comes to the ideology of Judaism, it's the same thing. It's truth and, 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 and falsehood. So therefore, there's nothing wrong with imposing this on a child. There's nothing wrong with giving your child the bris. Because again, religious observance is not a choice. It, it's emes. It, it's a truth that this is the correct thing to do. Not having a bris is the wrong thing to do. And therefore, in the same way that parents teach their children basic facts, the same way that parents uh, arrange vaccinations for their kids, because it is to their benefit, so likewise, it's the same thing. This is a fact. This is a moral fact, which is true, that bismillah is what a Jew should have. Not having bismillah is wrong, and therefore, we impose on our children without their consent, without their knowledge. That's the idea of a bismillah. Who comes to every bris? Oh, yeah. Eliyahu yeah. Anavi. And what does Chazal say? Who is really Eliyahu Anavi? Is Pinchas. Pinchas and Eliyahu Anavi are one and the same. And really, the fact that it comes to every bris is alluded to in our parsha when it says that God promises to Pinchas Brisi Shalom, the covenant of peace. That's a reference to Pinchas as Eliyahu attending every bris. And the idea is exactly that, because that's what Pinchas demonstrated. Pinchas demonstrated by carrying out this act of zealotry. And the Jews did not protest. And as a result, the Magay for the plague was averted. What Pinchas demonstrated is that to the Jews, in fact, that was the case. That tolerance had not become an ideology. In other words, the Jews might have not been willing to get involved. So they didn't protest the worship of poor, but on the other hand, they didn't protest the judges, and they didn't protest Pinchas' act of zealotry. Why? Because it's not that, that they turned tolerance into a value. If that would have been the case, they would have stopped Pinchas, they would have stopped the judges. They didn't. So why didn't they protest? They didn't protest because they were scared, frightened, lazy, whatever the reasons were. But if someone else is willing to take the chance, and stand up for what's right. Says so the Jews respected that. Says so that is really what happens in every bris, and Pinchas comes to testify to that as Elio Hanavi. As I'll mention as an aside, there's a very very lovely story about Elio Hanavi coming to a bris. Very very interesting story. There was a great rov in Europe in the city of Brod. And it was a Shlomo Kluger, it was a big big guy, he wrote many many svar, big Tamil and uh, when he came to Broad, his first week in Broad, there was a bris, and he was invited to come to the bris. So they told him what time is the bris, 8 o'clock. He comes 8 o'clock to the bris, and he sees not any rush to start the bris. So, okay, he figures that uh, the Jewish simchas run on their own schedule, so it was something totally unexpected, so he waited. But it's 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, it's really getting late, so finally he asks, what happened to the bris? So he said like this, you should know that the, the father of the baby is very, very sick. He's actually dying. And there's a custom in blood that if one of the relatives of a baby is dying, they delay the bris as long as possible that in case the person dies, they'll be able to name the baby after the person. That's the custom in blood. There's such a custom. So therefore they're waiting to see if he dies, maybe it was a grandfather, See if he dies, so they can name the baby after him. So he says, bring me to the, to the patient. So they bring him to the patient, and he takes one look at the patient, and he comes out and he says, do the bris immediately. And they did the bris, and the rough commander did the bris, and uh, sure enough, the patient got better. So they asked the rough, what, what happened? So he said like this, he said, when I saw the patient, and took one look, I saw there's nothing that could be done. The only thing that could save this person is Elio Anavi. But then I said to myself, how in the world am I going to bring Elio Anavi here? Mm -hmm. There's only one answer. Since he comes for every bris anyway, then once he's here, I can get him to go to the patient. Maybe he could help. So I said, make the bris right away. Make the bris right away. Elio Anavi came. I told Elio Anavi, see the patient. He went, saw the patient, cured the patient. That's how he got 
said it. Anyway, it's a story. Yeah. A lot of stories that will be on me. But in any case, this is the, the story of, uh, of, of Pinchas in this week's uh, Parsha. Now, I just mentioned an interesting thing, not related to anything of the above, just a thought that felt, yes. You mentioned earlier that back to Bilaam, this is your primitive section. When Yaakov wanted to talk about the end of days, he was stopped. How was it that Bilaam was essentially allowed to make mention about the end of days? Yaakov wanted to reveal when it would be. Mm -hmm. Bilaam didn't reveal when it would be. He says, I see it, but it's not now. I behold it, but it's not close. In other words, he said that it's far off. Mm -hmm. Yaakov wanted to reveal when the case would be. That it was the mission to do. Yeah. Um, I understood that Pinchas um, kind of tricked everybody. He came in sort of disguised. He put his spear under his cloak. But they wouldn't have had much of a chance to try to stop him even if they wanted to. He, he, was, he came in stealth. I don't know if that's that's uh, so simple. I don't know if that's that's uh, simple. The Sfarna certainly isn't learning that way. The Sfarna is learning they would have had ample opportunity to stop him. Two more questions. Part one is, from where do we understand that Bilam was the one who gave over this plot? It doesn't seem to be in the Parsha. It seems like he gave up and left. It's an explicit pasuk in Parsha's Matos, right? In Parshas Matos, when Moshe Rabbeinu tells the uh, Jewish people that they should have killed the women of Midian, so it says in the Pasuk, uh, I'll tell you the exact verse, um, this is chapter 31, verse uh, 16, right? But the women, they were to the children of Israel by the word of Bilaam, to commit an offense against God on the bar poor. So it says explicitly it was Bilaam's advice. Mm -hmm. And my other question was you've separated um, the Avodah Zara from the Eyes from the sexual misconduct, as if to say that they're two separate issues. But isn't it clear that the two are very connected, really? Well, again, that might be a second answer to the question. You know, the Gemara says a very interesting thing. It says, Lo ovdu Yisrael zara lahem arayas. The Gemara says that Klal Yisrael they, they knew that, that there was nothing to Avay Dazara. They knew that, that the worship of poor made no sense. They only did it to prevent for themselves a riot. The Marsha says in that Gemara that it's speaking specifically about this episode of Balpur. This, this Avay Dazara, they knew it was uh, theologically unsound. And therefore, it could be the sin of Balpur itself was really the sin of a riot. It really is the same sin. That's, that's possible. You know I'm saying that the Sparno. You don't have to come on to that. He understands that, that the issue of here is not what the sin was. The issue is the sin of apathy. And therefore, it makes no difference right. what you're protesting. Whether you're protesting Balpur or you're protesting uh, Zimri. It's the same thing. Right. Yeah. But, the, but in the ancient world, the sin of Avodazara was often very connected to. Yeah, the, 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 the Gemara itself says that. I'm just saying, but, 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 but the Sparta holds it. It doesn't matter which it is. You don't have to answer that to right. what it about. Let me show you. Yes. Getting back to Bill, uh, he was a prophet for the boy, and, and uh, he had the prophecy and all that. But he went around to curse people. Uh, it's kind of thinking of a prophet, someone who's sacred, you know, and and, and uh, you know it's holy. And, and how, can, uh, how can you have a person like him being a prophet? Like he he, he wasn't. He wasn't a manager. I mean, he didn't go. He, he just went, went went around to curse people yeah. to, to, to yeah. have that that type of uh, midot. Why would yeah. why would I don't know? I kind of struggle. Let me let me let me share with you a thought that uh, we discussed in a different class a week ago, really addressing this uh, this point. Because I'll say again that uh, on the verse which says there was no prophet in Israel equal to Moshe. Because I'll say, but among the nations there was, and there was Bilam. Bilam, in some way, was the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu. 
And this is that nations shouldn't have an excuse. Had you given us a profit, we also would have repented and we would have turned over a new leaf, it would have been better. And God gave them a profit, and you see what happened. Now, the problem is this. The problem is that uh, you know, Bilaam may have been a prophet. He did prophesy on several occasions to uh, relate praises of the Jewish people, but we don't see that Bilaam was ever sent on a mission to reach out to the nations. There was no message that he transmitted to the nations to repent or be better. And uh, secondly, the nations still have a great excuse. They could say, listen, you gave us a prophet like Bilaam, you have given us a prophet like Moshe, I mean, we would have been better. So we explain what Chazal are getting at in, in the following way. Now, there's a Gemara that says in uh, Mesech Zerubim that Rishayim, the wicked, Afilu al pischa shal Gehenim, Enam chaysim b'tshubi. Even by the doorway of Gehenim, they don't repent. Now, we know that the next world is called the Olam Ha'enas. It's called the world of truth. The world of truth. That means uh, in the next world, we are shown everything with crystal clear clarity. Some say that really is the the fire of Gehenna. What is the fire of Gehenna? Are you ever embarrassed? You feel like your ears are burning? Right? Now, there's a, by the way, there's a physiological cause for that. When the blood rushes to your face, you turn red. So you feel the warmth. So that's why uh, shame uh, is accompanied by a, by a burning sensation. Some say that's what the fires of Gehenna are. It's the fires of embarrassment because when we are shown the video of our lives and we see exactly what we did and we see it with crystal clear clarity, we are so embarrassed it's as if we're stepping into a fire. You know, um, have you ever found yourself in a situation, maybe uh, at this point it's uh, we're beyond that, but um, Maybe when uh, all of us were younger and our parents were telling stories about us, embarrassing stories about us to our, their friends, mm -hmm. they just wanted to crawl into a hole. <laughs> right? That's what Gavin is like. Uh, you see these, these uh, images of yourself with the audio also, and you just, you're so embarrassed. It's like being in a fight. So why don't they repent? So if you see the truth with such clarity, why don't the wicked repent? So if Dessler says an amazing thing, Dessler says there are two different things. There are There is what you know, and there is what you want. And the two do not go hand in hand. You know, Dessler doesn't quote this, but you know, this was a great dispute between Plato and Aristotle. Plato believed that the key to virtue was education because no one would knowingly do something wrong. And therefore, if you educate people as to what is right and what is wrong, they will live virtuous lives. That's what Plato said. Aristotle said it's not true, because there's an aspect of personality which he calls incontinence, which is the inability to live up to your convictions. And it may be that you know what is right and what is wrong, and yet you cannot bring yourself to live in accordance with that. Now, the reason Plato and Aristotle had these divergent opinions is because Plato was a geometer by profession. He locked himself in the ivory tower and he dealt with ideal forms, ideal shapes, and geometry and so on and so forth. He understood the world as it should be. And you're right, as the world should be, if a person knows what's right and what's wrong, he should live accordingly. So Aristotle was a naturalist, he was an observer of the world. Right? And he saw that it isn't so. Right? There are people that know plenty of things, and yet they don't live up to the truth. And uh, that, by the way, is that the symbolism, that famous painting of Rubens, of uh, Plato and Aristotle in the Lyceum in the Academy, where Plato is pointing up, and Aristotle has his hand motioning downward, because Plato is pointing up to heaven, to the ideal forms where things should be. And Aristotle was pointing downward to the world as it actually is. But in any case, 
So this is an old debate, and in this debate, I think we can assume Aristotle was right. That it's true that a person could know what is right and what is wrong, and yet he is not in control, and what he wants is still what he wants, despite the fact that he knows that it's wrong. Uh, you know, the fact that people, at, by, by this juncture, there are many people that still smoke cigarettes, even though they know it is harmful, but they just can't bring themselves to stop. They don't have that type of, of control. So this is like this. When you go to the next world, you know plenty. It's the Elam Lamas. The truth is revealed to you. Right? That doesn't mean that you change. You still want what you want. You want what you always wanted. Your midos, your character, your personality, your temperament doesn't change. What you know changes. It doesn't make a difference what you know. Now, it's an amazing thing. That means like this, that on the one hand, you know the truth, but on the other hand, you're helpless to change. That's terribly frightening. But let me share with you an amazing thing. The, there's a, the Vilna Gaon says, you know, the, it says in the, in the Pasuk, that one of the punishments of the next world is called kafakela. Kafakela is a slingshot. So what does it mean a slingshot? That the soul goes to the next world and it's thrown around from one end of the world to the other end of the world, back and forth, back and forth, like with a slingshot. That's the punishment of the kafakela. So what does that mean? So the gon says a frightening thing. The gon says like this. The gon, uh, I'll, I'll with a muscle. You ever, you ever have this happen in your house? One of the kids comes home and they're looking for something to eat and it's just, they know exactly what they want and they open every cabinet, looking for it, and it's here, no, not there, slam that one, open this one, slam that one, open that one, slam that one, right? And that they're looking desperately for that one morsel that they like to eat, and they can't find it anywhere, ever happen in your house? Like every day? <laughs> Both of them. So, so it's like this. You go to the next world, whatever you wanted in this world, you still want in the next world. <laughs> And you're desperate looking for it. But one thing I can promise you, it's not there. In the next world, it's not whatever it is you're into, whether it's a fancy car or a nice house or good things to eat, it's not there in the next world. So you go to the next world and you're looking desperately for it. You're flying from one end of the world to the other end of the world, looking, looking, trying to find your desire. You can't find it. That is the slingshot. That is the kafakela. Because it's the oil of madness, it's the world of truth. What you know is what you know, but your desire is still intact. So therefore, the wicked, despite the fact that they come to the next world, they know everything, they don't repent, they don't change. That's what the Gemara Nerevin says. The nations of the world have a Pisgahn pad. They have an excuse. They're going to come after 120 years, the next world, and they'll tell God like this. They'll say, listen. You know what the Jews were better than us? Because the Jews had access to information we did not have access to. The Jews had a Navi like Moshe. Moshe told them all sorts of things. What's right and what's wrong and mitzvahs and good deeds. So they had access to this special information. And therefore they were good. Says, we did not have access to that information. We did not have a Navi. And therefore that's why we weren't good. So what is the presumption of that argument? Then what is the key to virtue? Information. If you know the right things, you'll live the right way. Right? So the Jews had a Navi who gave them this information. And we didn't have a Navi who ga gave this information. And that's why we didn't live accordingly. So God says, I'll tell you what. I'll prove to you that it has nothing to do with what you know. What's the proof? I'll, the proof is Bilam. It's not that Bilaam is the prophet who charged the nations of the world to do the right thing. The proof is Bilaam himself. Bilaam knew whatever Moshe Rabbeinu knew. Did it make a difference? Was he a tzaddik to Moshe Rabbeinu? No. So apparently, the reason Moshe was a tzaddik is not because of what he knew. <laughs> right? Bilaam knew whatever Moshe Rabbeinu knew, and you see what Bilaam was. Exactly this point. So that's the proof. The proof is that the key to virtue is not what you know. The key to virtue is what you are. Right? And if you're not that, if temperamentally you're not there, you can have all the information that Moshe Rabbeinu has, and you'll still be a Russia, 
to the point of utter corruption? That is the answer. That's, that, that is the refutation to the nations of the world. If they come and say, if you only would have given us a Navi, if only we would have had access to that special information, so God says, what do you mean? What are you telling me? What, it's, it's the information. Bill had have access to that information. <laughs> what does it do for him? Right? And this is an important thing to know. You know, a, a lot of people think that the, the key to virtue is, is learning more. If you learn more, you'll be a better person. It, it, it can't hurt, of course, learning more. But Revolver, one of the great Balei Musser, writes that Rabbi Sosalanter, when he talked about Musser, always divided Musser into two halves. There was the learning of Musser, the learning of Jewish ethical works, and there was the Avaidas of Musser, the putting it into practice. In other words, there were techniques and methods and uh, methods of conditioning, training a person to live an ethical life. It's not the learning which is, which is enough. It's not what you know. You really have to make a conscious effort to, to train yourself to act differently, to live differently. And the role rights, that disappeared. That, that was lost. So that's why we're, to a certain extent, in the mess we are, we are in. But that's what the, the story of Bilaam is, is a cautionary tale. That don't think that knowledge is the key to virtue. It, it really requires a lot of working on yourself, which is not just learning. It means forcing yourself, conditioning yourself to, to act in an appropriate way. One of the Rishonim, maybe Ben Bachayat, does speak this out. And the Gemara says that uh, there's a concept of chazaka. Chazaka means a pattern. And uh, there's a dispute in the Gemara about how many times is it necessary to establish a pattern, two times, three times. But generally, it's accepted that a pattern is established three times. If you have an ox, so an ox is presumed to be tame. But if three times it, it gores in a destructive way, that uh, impresses upon you that this ox is the exception, it needs to be guarded, and therefore your liability is increased if uh, you fail to guard it. So three times always establishes a chazaka. You know, one time could be a fluke, two times could be a fluke. Something happens three times, that means it's real. You know? So whenever God wants to impress something upon Bilam, it has to happen three times. Now the first time you can write off. Now the second time you can write off. If it happens three times, you know that the donkey uh, <laughs> is really talking, right? Um, you know, uh, two times maybe Bilam could stumble in his speech. But if three times he says the exact opposite of what he intended to say, that means God is putting the words in his mouth. That's why, you know, here the threes make sense. Now that's the idea of chazok. It's, it's a pattern which shows this is the way it's meant to be. It's not the fluke. It's not a random occurrence. Okay, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you.